This is Natalia Mainetto and Fernando Mainetto. Natalia was my Alabama teammate for three years. Um, she was a year younger than me. And her dad was also a college tennis player at Clemson and played professionally. And Natalia played professionally as well. And it's really cool because he was her coach as well, just like my dad was my coach. So um, just a really fun experience. So I kind of want to just talk to you all today about your process of growing up, having a parent as your coach who also played at a really high level, because um, there's obviously some expectations there, even if they're not talked about. Um, and kind of, Fernando, too, how you saw it developing Natty um, and, you know, the things you thought you did really well and maybe the things you would have done differently. But I kind of think just start out, either of y'all can go, but Natalia, talk about how you got started playing tennis and maybe how old you were and when you started taking it seriously. I mean, I started, I feel like as soon as I started walking, <laughs> Um, my dad obviously has been teaching forever. So, um, I kind of just grew up with, in his tennis basket and on the court and, um, you know, played here and there. And I think it's kind of a hard question for me to say when I started seriously, because I feel like every year it got a little more serious. So I always did summer camps and stuff. I think by age five, I started kind of doing summer camps and stuff. <laughs> No, and, no, yeah, not later. that early. No, later. maybe like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, so yeah, and then I think ever, you know, every year I just gradually started playing a little bit more and more. And then I think um, my first tournament when I was eight. And then um, I think that's when I started, it became my main sport. Cause I Do you remember how you did in your first tournament? I actually won my first tournament. Nice. Yeah, it was one of those, like, um, you know, we didn't have, like, the orange bowl, red, orange or red ball, but um, it was, like, a, it wasn't a U.S., it was a USTA, but I forget what they're called, but it wasn't, like, you know, it was it a was local. It was a program local, by local. Spike and Sam. Yeah, it was a local. <laughs> and he right. had, like, a series of summer tournaments for kids to learn how to. Yeah you know, how to start the game, you know, call the score, call the balls, learn about the game. And, yeah. And that's how you start. Yeah. So I started out with those tournaments and then, you know, locals, you know, what was next? Sectionals, designated. And every year it was like the bigger tournaments I could get into, the bigger ones I would play. So. Yeah. That's cool. I think most people I've talked to, they say they started their first tournament around like eight to 10. And then it's funny, too, because I ask people how they did, and they're like, yeah, I won my first tournament. And it's just interesting to, to hear that as even when you're really little, having that amount of success. So, Fernando, did you always know she was going to play tennis? Oh, Sorry. No, obviously, you know, by me being a tennis pro and being at the club, they will come and they got motivated, both Tanya and Natalia, to play tennis when they were young. And um, it was more about fun. It was more about getting them on the court, getting them exposed to a sport, and then, you know, see how it goes from there. Natty, did you play any other sports besides tennis? I did. I started out with dance. Um, I did soccer after that, I remember. And then after that, I was actually really into gymnastics. And then about eight is when my dad was like, all right, we're going to have to kind of decide here which way you want to go. And I decided on tennis. So did you think just because, did, do you feel like you made that decision on your own at age eight or were you the most successful there or you liked it the most or what? I think it was a combo. I honestly, I don't really remember my what I, you know, the process of how I, <laughs> what I broke it down. Yeah, eight years old. <laughs> I don't think I really remember. But, um, but I do know that I had more success in, uh, in tennis for sure. And I think that the resources were a little more limited. And I think I was a little influenced, but I don't know, I could be wrong. <laughs> but I think <laughs> that tennis definitely, I, I knew I had better results in tennis at that time. So, yeah. So, Fernando, talk a little bit, because, um, Natalia, was your dad your main coach all of juniors? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I went to 
camps and, you know, other coaches helped me out through like throughout my whole career actually. But um, he was always my main coach. Okay. So was- Fernando, talk a little bit about how you wanted to develop Natalia's game. And if you feel like that looked like your own game or things that were in your own game that you wish were different, different in her game. So just talk about your, you, the way you went about coaching her and developing her game. Uh, well, I'm making you think way back long ago. <laughs> well, obviously that you want to teach him the right way, you know, the, um, the, per, the right grips, the right form. And at the same time, you have the qualities of the player. Natalia was very reluctant to change her own game. She didn't like if I corrected her serve. No, 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 I want to do it this way. <laughs> if I wanted to correct her forehand, no, 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 let me do it this way. I didn't like change. She, 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 <laughs> I still she, don't like change. She really didn't like messing up her game or changing her game. So, and then you have that I was her coach, but I was her dad. So if I pushed too hard, you know, maybe she would have just said, you know, I don't want to play tennis anymore. You're too hard on me. There were several times, as you may have with your dad, when she left the court in tears. And then, you know, I'm getting punished on the court. I'm getting punished at home because <laughs> then you have Paulina, my wife, saying, you're too hard on them. You're, you know, so... So it, it was an experience where you had to balance a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. And I think you, I mean, just briefly talking about that, it is it is a hard balance. Um, and I can relate because my dad was my coach. And you, the biggest thing you don't want to break is your relationship with your daughter, but you also want to push her to be the best she can be. So. Right. We'll talk about that a little bit. How did you find a balance in that? Because y'all still have a great relationship. She still really trusts you. We would call you in college to talk about doubles things. And so you're, you were still an amazing resource for her. So how do you think you, you pushed her, but not pushed her to the point of where she wanted to quit or wanted to, to break a relationship with you? Well, the number one thing was fuel what she did best you know, really kind of enhance that even though she might not be in the prettiest or the, you know, when I always told people, you know, when she was playing a match, people say, I don't think Natalia is going to beat that player. And then all of a sudden at the end, they will come out and say, how was she doing? Oh, no, she won two and two. Really? <laughs> so um, the, fuel, the fuel was that she was, you know, like a hard competitor. I mean, I, since she was little, I told her, if the opponent hits seven balls, how many you hit? She would go eight. If she hits 10, I'll hit 11. So she was brought around under that. So she was determined to use that quality of herself to develop that, you know, sort of resilience on the court. And when she did that and won that way, I remember that she never played them. After playing those little tournaments at eight or nine, the first designated, I think at that time, they were still allowing 10-year-olds to play designated tournaments, yeah. came to Naples, and it was at the YMCA. She'd never heard of a designated. There were 250 kids trying to play and qualify. Well, she got to the semifinals. Wow. And she beat some players that were already ranked in Florida. Of course, at 10 years old, they don't know much, but she was a fierce competitor. And when she went out there, she won because... She just didn't want to lose the ball. So after that, she kind of got spooked. I don't want to play tennis anymore. You know, because I said, you know, this would be a great thing for you to, you know, maybe go, go play a few tournaments here and there in Florida. And she actually quit for a year, a little bit over a year. She didn't want to play any tournaments. And then and about, yeah, about a year and a half, she said, well, I want to go back and play a little more tournaments. It was getting to be in the 12. So then that's where she restarted and, got a little more serious, started joining an academy that we had here with a couple of Colombian players, Nestor Nunez and, and Hernan Nunez. So she would go there in the afternoons. But at the same time, it's also hard because you don't want to take them away from their normal life. Let's go to school. Let me have my friends. Let me have my, 
like parties with my friends and and uh, sleepovers, whatever you want to call them. So it was not until later than, you know, she decided that this is what she wanted to do and maybe go into homeschooling because I always said, look, if the best chance you have to really do something with this is to get a scholarship and go to college. I mean, mm -hmm. that's your ultimate goal. Your goal should be get a great education in a great environment and uh, play competitive sports in college is what I remember was a great experience. Yeah. Talk, Natty, talk about, I love that your dad said he was building this mindset new early of they hit seven balls, you hit eight. Because I think, I mean, just to talk about you a little bit from, from my experience as a teammate, I mean, we talked about this this past weekend. You played a point our freshman year, your freshman year, we were tied three all with Vanderbilt, and it was an eight-minute point. And I'd never seen a point so long, and thank God I wasn't playing it because I would have lost it in 30 seconds because that wasn't my game style. Um, but just talk about from an early age kind of how your dad as your coach was building this mindset. And, and you know, it's through the mental game, but also through potentially – drills you were doing or other things that gave you this mentality of just, I'm going to grind my opponent down and I don't care how long it takes. Yeah. I think everybody's just got their kind of talents. And I think that was just kind of what mine was kind of just based on was I knew I wasn't the quickest. I knew I wasn't the strongest and I didn't know necessarily, but I didn't care. I was like, all right, this is how I'm going to win. This is, you know, just this is what I can control and I think it was just kind of in me like I just didn't you know I don't know I just kind of focused on that and and kind of grew off of that and um yeah I just remember from a young age that's kind of what was one of the main things I went into the match focusing on was all right I'm going to be consistent this is my you know this is my game style I'm going to focus on important points which was 30 15 you know 40 30 so it was like um that's just kind of what my basics were and I just kind of um it was just the the fighter in me I think was always just there I don't know I just was kind of I've always been a perfectionist so I just think that um I knew I could just give my best and that's what I could focus on so yeah did anyone this might sound funny but and I'm only asking this because I know you well enough and I know you can hit the crap out of the ball. Did anyone in juniors ever call you a pusher? Oh my gosh. If I had a dollar for every time I was called a pusher, I'd, I'd be retired now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I got called a lot of names, a lot, you know, pusher was for sure. Um, and, you know, I, I look back and it and it's tough because it did take a toll on me, I think, long term, because I think that then, I didn't think about it as much and it didn't phase me. But then I think once you kind of got into the bigger tournaments and, you know, um, you just start to hear what everyone's saying and it starts to get into your head, it kind of gets in your own psychology where it's like you start believing it. You're like, I, I am only a pusher, you mm -hmm. know, instead of believing, no, I do have weapons, but this is what I'm best at and not necessarily pushing, but just being consistent, not, you know, overdoing it or whatever. And so I just feel like, yeah, I, down the road, I think it got to me um, a little bit more than in the beginning. The beginning, I kind of thrived off of it. I didn't really, it didn't phase me. But, um, but you know, later on, you know, you just have the other factors that kind of play into your game. And yeah. being called a pusher in college was definitely not, um, I think after freshman year, it kind of backlashed. But, like, freshman year, it worked for me, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you lost a freaking match. Um, and I think I, I like how you talk about that, because I think as a coach and and my game style is very different. But I think now when I teach, I'm like, you know, I get these kids. Oh, they're such a pusher. They're such a whatever. And I'm like, no, they know how to win a point. Yeah. And they know how to beat you. And they're the most annoying players you play. Mm -hmm. I would much rather play a hard hitter who could only make three balls than play you. Like, honestly, because I knew in practice, if I'm going to beat her, I got I to gotta make sure I'm making every ball. And if I get one opportunity, I have to take it. 
And yeah. I think it's a good point to talk about because not everyone, like you're not six feet tall and, you know, Serena size. So that's not necessarily going to be your game style, but you relied on, Hey, this is what I'm really good at. And yeah. I think a good coach, which your dad is, is exactly what he said. I fueled the best in her it, because not every player is going to be able to have every weapon. It yeah. just, it doesn't exist. So Natty, talk a little bit about your relationship with your dad. Cause he, he said, you know, it was tough being coming home and you know, your mom being like, oh, you're pushing them too hard. And then also being on the court. Talk about how you handled your dad as being your dad and your coach. It was definitely tough. I mean, I think that it was hard to have a boundary of when he was my dad and when he was my coach. I think that it's hard because I was young, so I can't say I handled it with maturity. And I can't say that I handled it with maturity until even my professional career. <laughs> I think that that's one of the things I wish I could have been better at. But it's hard. I mean, I think it's easier said than done. And I think it does take somebody really elite to work with a parent and be able to um, on both ends. I know he, I, my dad definitely tried, but he also would, you know, it would, it would definitely mesh. I mean, at home he would talk about tennis and there's, you know, it wasn't, I think it's, he's like, another level in this fashion. For me, I could go home and turn tennis off and I would be fine with that for the rest of the evening. So we clashed in that because I was passionate, but I don't think I was, I could never be as passionate. I mean, he's just like one of a kind. So, um, so there was times where it was like, he would want to, you know, breathe, eat, talk, sleep tennis, and I could come home and, you know, so I think at home, the boundary, and we communicated that, I think, as the years went on. But, you know, when you're young, it's hard because I'm, you know, I can't say I was an angel either. I mean, I was definitely a brat sometimes. Sometimes it's hard and it's, easy. Yeah. you know, it's, it's, <laughs> so I'll be honest. Yeah. I was the same way. It's okay. Um, so in saying that, kind of talk about growing up and being at home, you know, before college, talk about the things that you think your dad as your coach did really, really well that, you know, you think helped you with your game or your mentality the most? I think that what always gave me comfort was trust, knowing that like whatever tantrum I could throw or, you know, or what, but he was always going to be there to want what's best for me. And I think that that was a good thing, but also a bad thing because sometimes there were some days that, you know, I took advantage of that. But, um, but I think was just trusting him and that he wanted what was best for me. And, and, and I really did trust his knowledge. I mean, I think he's a little more old school with how he, his way of training was and everything, but, um, but the mentality, the, the, you know, the um, strategy side of it and the um, just like hitting one more ball, something as simple as that. I think it really developed me as a fighter. I think I always was a fighter, but from a young age kind of um, established that in me and, you know, recognizing the score and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just think that the trust was huge and just that feeding that passion into me made me want to be successful and passionate on the court. And, and so um, having, yeah, just having that trusting relationship and knowing that he was going to give me his all. And so I was trying to give it him back my all. <laughs> yeah. Good I was she got to a lever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never you never left her to walk home from a tournament? There no. was some close counters, I think. <laughs> so that's awesome. I'm glad she got to brag on you a little bit, Fernando. I think that's really important just you know, being from the coach's side and I've talked about it with a lot of people over the past couple of weeks of just do my players trust me? Do they trust that I believe in them? I have the best for them. And that was you too, Natty. Like you weren't going to buy into a change of your grip or your stroke. Right. If you didn't trust what he was doing, you have to have the buy-in. So Fernando, yeah. talk a little bit. Natty got to brag on you, but talk a little bit of if you were to go back and, you know, go through her training again, what would you, would you have done anything differently? Um, well, you know, when you really start coaching somebody, you have to have an, you have to evaluate 
that person in all levels, right? Um, it's Natalia explosive. Does she have the strength? Uh, does she have the mental capacity to train long time? Is she emotionally strong? Is she passionate about the game? Is she a hard worker? Does she have a good technique or talented? So all those things you have to kind of conjugate and really come up with the best plan possible. So um, my goal was just to keep her in the game as long as she could and let her discover eventually what would the next steps for her to be. So for her to be successful in college and then realize when she was in the professional level that was just much harder and that's part of life, I think it's, it's, it's great. I mean, I was, from my end, I'm very happy that I was able to share all those moments and trips to California, to the Nationals in Tennessee, to go to New York. I mean, to go to these places around the country and, and see her perform and be her crime pillow and <laughs> the punching bag for her frustrations, you know, it, it, and, and to do it together, it's, I, I think it's very rewarding. I mean, I, I would not trade it anything, you know, for the world. I don't think that I could have done it any differently or better. Um, very happy the way we really moved along and um and we still are i mean it's just part of life right yeah i think that's cool how you talk about having her discover things for herself because i think as a coach sometimes you can regurgitate so much information to your player that they don't have time to think or discover for themselves which then it becomes not natalia's game but your game for natalia Right. And You're trying to perform through them, and that can't happen. Yeah, yeah. Again, that ownership and trust takes hold. So, Natty, talk a little bit. Um, talk about your recruiting process. How did you end up picking, and how did you end up choosing Alabama? Yeah, so I feel like um, I was actually kind of in my own world. I feel like I only fo – which was kind of a good thing because I only focused on that year, that tournament. Like, it wasn't like I thought too far ahead. And so by the time it was like sophomore, junior year, I just felt like I thought, oh, I'm going to play pro. That's it. There's nothing. I didn't really ever follow college sports. I mean, my dad went to Clemson. Um, one of his uh, students that I grew up idolizing went to Duke. So I only really paid attention to like Duke, you know. He, what, he never followed college football. So it wasn't like we were a big college sports family, you know. So I just kind of didn't really, you know, I wasn't in the college sports world. And so I just um, – you know, one day when I was like, all right, well, you know, I think you, there's still a lot of, you need to develop a lot as a player to be able to play pro. So I think the best step now is to think about college. And so just kind of, I feel like I thought about it, um, sophomore, you know, closer to junior year when, you know, with recruiting and everything, I think it worked to my favor because I didn't have a lot of build up of pressure, nerves, thinking about which school I wanted to go, like which was yeah. my school and, I think it worked for me, but I think now if I did it all over again, obviously there would be a, a lot more pressure on myself to want to get into a certain school or a certain program. Or, um, so once I kind of decided I was going to go the college route instead of, you know, the pro route, um, I basically just, it was easy for me because I was like, all right, I've been playing outdoor tennis, grinding tennis my whole life. I don't want to play indoor tennis, you know, <laughs> fast course, just not my, not my thing. So I basically went to, um, I went to the NCAA and I went to the top, like the top ranked schools, I guess it was top 60 or something like that. And I just went every state that was warm. <laughs> so I went to <laughs> California, Texas and anything south of University of Virginia. <laughs> yeah. All D1, you know, and then I just kind of, I literally emailed every single school and then whichever school got back to me. Um, I just kept in touch with and then because um, I also wanted to go to a program that I felt like wanted me and I felt like I was going to be able to start because I did want to play after school. Yeah, so I wanted to go to a program that I knew was going to really be invested in me as a person, as a player. So. Um, so, yeah, the ones that kind of gave me the time of day I kept in touch with and, you know, um, tried to develop a relationship with the coach and see what they were like. And then, you know, kind of just built that up until visits. But um, 
I also, Andres Pedroso is the coach at Virginia, the men's, he's a huge mentor for me. I mean, he was the one that guided me through the, because my dad went to Clemson, but he went there, what, I mean, over 30 years ago, so it was like a whole different process. And Only five, he played five years ago, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, you know, so it's just, um, so Andres helped me, and, and I really, I'm so grateful to have somebody like that who was able to guide me in the, you know, the right um, mentality and and um, and yeah and so then I, I had talked to I also you know I didn't know much about conferences so I knew that I, it would be a great thing to go to a conference like the SEC or the ACC or the Pac-12 Pac <laughs> like I don't even know college sports anymore so um so yeah, and then I just kind of uh, kept in touch with the schools, and the rest is history. I talked to you know Jenny, kept in touch a lot, and um, and you know, and then I kind of narrowed down my uh, visits. And once I visited, that was game over. Once I visited Alabama, it was game over. Just the team and and, and the reception. And Emily was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was the I got her there in Alabama. Yeah, except I didn't have a great memory of you because you beat me in the juniors. I and I didn't, I didn't have a great memory of you because you threw a timber uh, tantrum on the court when I beat you. Yeah, but that was that's typical. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that was just um, a sum up of it, pretty much. But I was yeah. Really cool. I think it's cool to hear you talk about because talking to some of my students right now and they're going through the recruiting process, and some of them are like, I know exactly the type of school I want. I think everyone just has a different story. I mean, yeah. for, for you to talk about too, which I think really helped you in the long run, which you talk about as well, is you weren't so concerned about it so early. And now because recruiting's been, been pushed up so much, I mean, people are freshmen in college and they're thinking, oh, where am I going to play? And they just have yeah. so much time. And yeah. I think sometimes when we get so focused on the future, we can't take care of what's going on right now. And I, I can't imagine playing all those tournaments and thinking, oh, my gosh, what if I lose? And, and is this school going to still like me? Um, because we know, based on once we were in college and who our coaches were recruiting, like, it really doesn't come down to how well they did in a tournament. But how do they fit on the team? Are they able to develop? And do they want to be there? So I really love that. Okay, so – Let's let's finish up with a couple more questions, but I want to ask you, Natalia, what um, what is probably something you did growing up with your dad that you feel like other juniors weren't doing? Is there like a drill, or you went extra, you know, time out and did serves or match play, or what sticks out to you? It was interesting because I feel like my training was very basic, um, like standard. You know, it was like um, there was one drill though that we, I mean and you're familiar with it because I think I brought, I introduced it to Jenny and we did it a lot at school and everyone hated me for <laughs> bringing that drill because it's hard. It was, it was called the corner drill. And, um, and we did that a lot. And I feel like that really was a drill we always, you know, incorporated in practice during the week. And, um, and it focused on consistency and intent, like a short, intense, consistent drill, um, that focused on working the point and not necessarily winning it. And, um, and you know, you're hitting like eight, 10 balls to one corner and that person's moving you, one person's in the corner, one person's full court. And you're, you're playing like three fourths of the court, not line to line to give them a chance to recover. And, and then you finish the point with either a short ball to the open court after eight, 10 balls. And I mean, you do that like five, 10 minutes, it's tough. You're so exhausted. I, yeah, it's it's immensely tough and it's a physically it, as intense as you want to make it. And so um, I did that drill a lot growing up. But, you know, we did a lot of basket feeding, too. And I feel like um, I don't really feel like I did anything super out of the norm. I just think that she I hated would, hidden serves. <laughs> I hate <laughs> hidden serves out of the basket. I will say working hard. On, I worked hard, but I feel like it, it was, it was an intense hour. I, he really was like quality over quantity. Yeah. And that I thrived off of too, because I just really, I didn't want to be on the court five hours a day. It wasn't, it wasn't. And I think that that's the difference between somebody that 
is elite and it, because it's like you've got to want it and I wanted it but not past hour four necessarily you know so it's uh I feel like I'll I'll admit that and um and yeah so I feel like uh you know we, d we didn't do anything out of the norm but I think what was good was the intensity of it and the focus like I had to do it focused and I had to do it intense even if it was an hour so I think that that's um, the difference in our practices versus, I don't know, going to like camp or like a junior program for two or three hours where you're hitting a lot of balls, but are you really locked in? Are you focused on your, on your, you know, what you're trying to get done that day? And I think that we always had a purpose and whether or not I was, you know, super fast or whatever it is, I was focused on what I was doing. So yeah, I think that was a I huge difference. I, I agree with you on that. I was not a player who was playing five hours a day and I wasn't yeah. homeschooled. And frankly, in high school, I maybe did two and a half hours, maybe a little bit more, but that quality is so important. And I think something too that, that I took for granted growing up and maybe you did too was your dad was at most of your practices and your yeah. matches. So he knew exactly what you needed to work on. Yeah. So you were able to get that quality yeah. where we coach somebody and we haven't seen them play in a tournament in a month and they're only telling us, Hey, this is what yeah. I didn't do well. So, yeah, that's so true. Cool. yeah. So talk about a little bit. And then if anyone has any questions, somebody asked if we played, who would win? Natalia would win right now. No, I don't know. <laughs> we would go back and forth in college. So I feel like, yeah, yeah. I feel like we did. I don't know. I think we've had a pretty even, we Even never had a matches match juniors though, like a real, real. Match. No, we never played. No, I definitely played a couple. No, I, I think only played one of our teammates in an ITF, but or in a. In you guys a, didn't have challenge in matches in ITA, in college. We would we would play matches, but Jenny wouldn't necessarily say like, "Oh, if you won that set, you would win." Because I remember even my freshman year, I played. I wasn't in the lineup, and I played Courtney McLean, and she played three. And I like beat her in a practice set and it didn't change anything. <laughs> like, okay. Oh man. Matches um, every week in college. Yeah. yeah. My dad did too. They had challenge matches all the time. Yeah. Um, Natty, talk a little bit of your transition to playing professionally and the difference. Um, Cause Fernando said, you know, it's just another level. Talk about the difference in training and the difference in playing from college tennis and professional tennis. Gosh, I feel like there were so many factors because um, college tennis, it's, there's so much structure that, you know, you have a routine every day, every week, you know, going to workouts, you know, your matches are going to be on Fridays and Sundays, and you're going to practice as a team, you're going to have the, the trainer there for any pains or aches. And so it's just, a, it's just a totally different world. And I had, and that was always, I always wanted to live it because I never done it I had never played crows in the summers or before in juniors I had never had a taste of it and so it was really it's just it was it was hard to go from four years of being basically pampered I mean we we work we work we so worked hard. hard yeah so hard but we also had amazing resources and I feel like pro tennis just felt like the bottom of the pyramid again like it was just like it was hard I mean you're on your own um you're you know you're staying in in, in not so nice hotels and you're not eat, you're eating the the food that's at the resorts and it's it gets tiring after the second week and you know you're losing the second day of the week and then you've got to you've got to find the motivation to train on your own and find people to train with and you know the people don't want to train and it's just it's it was really hard to compare because I felt like it was two different worlds and then I feel like um in college, not that it's easier to win, but I feel like you have more wins. Whereas in pros, mentally, it was a lot harder for me because I feel like I had not, I had forgotten what it was like to lose so much. I mean, mm. I don't know if, you know, it's because it, it is a different level. You just, it's harder to catch a break. Like you don't really get that confidence boost where you, you know, you just have to really take a lot of slaps before you can kind of just, um, you know, I get, I guess, catch, you know, some confidence and have a better week. And so I just feel like I really early on took the losses too, too hard. 
and that's something I kind of regret. I feel like I had a few wins in qualies, and I feel like if I would have just had more perspective then that, you know, you're going to lose a lot more than you're going to win. And that people told me that, but I feel like I really didn't, like, feel that. You know, like, it was easy to hear, but I, I couldn't really apply that, taking that pressure off. So I feel like, I don't know, in college, you, you have that support system. I mean, you have, you know, sports psychologists if you need it. You have a team, you know, you have a team that's supporting you, that wants you to win. And so it was kind of hard to go from that and having so many matches behind, you know, so many matches week after week to have another opportunity. And pros, you don't. You lose. You have to wait another week to play another match and feel that pressure and have that positive mindset. And I just feel like, I struggled to have that positive mindset in pros, whereas in college, you kind of had no choice. Like, you were like, if you don't <laughs> yeah. have a positive mindset, you're out. Like, you're not playing. You know, and I feel like it's just, it's a different pressure in pros, and the level is, you know, I in the 15Ks, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like that, you know, I feel like college tennis, it has, it, it's a big level, but um I don't know. It was just, it was, a, I think for me, the biggest difference was my mentality. I, n I noticed a shift in my mentality and pros that I had not seen in, mm -hmm. um, in my game before. And I think I just, it was, I put a lot of pressure on myself and, but if you think about it, I think it's kind of normal because you're, you're taking away so many things you had before, which was support. And, um, you know, you had a purpose in juniors. You're trying to, play to get to college or get into bigger tournaments and in, and in college you're playing for your team you're playing to you're you're playing for an accomplishment I think in pros it's for yourself again and so it's like you don't really have that you have to get into bigger tournaments but I think you just have to dig even deeper you know so it was hard pros was definitely hard and and the level the level is there but I just feel like it's so much more mental and um and you have to you have to find a way to enjoy it. And I think that if it gets, in my case, it was getting a little more negative than positive. And I feel like that's when I had to take I had to kind of take a step back and realize, okay, I can't I don't want to disrespect the sport like this that's mm. giving me so much, you know? Yeah. So that's cool. That's cool to hear your take on that because I think a lot of people have lived that life, whether it has been the pros or not, is just understanding that a lot of external motivation can help you in your game. Yeah. Uh, and that when you're not motivated to either in college go to a teammate or find a sports psychologist or go to your coach. Um, and I think juniors too, you can feel that, oh, I'm all by myself, but you do have college to look forward to if you want to play at that level. Um, that's really awesome. So we'll, we'll leave you with this. What is one of your favorite highlights of both your tennis careers? Ooh. That's a tough one. I mean, mine was by far in, in, at school. Mine was by far. I mean, it's hard because it's like every win had such a different, you know, meaning. And I think that my freshman year being able to accomplish a lot of firsts as a team and just clinching that, I mean, that's a pressure that you just, it's hard to like, because it's not pressure you're just putting on yourself. It's, it's pressure it's a whole team you're playing for. So I feel like that one, I mean, any of those went like wins as a team, I feel like those big wins in college for me were like one of the highlights. I think like winning SEC, like things like that were just, you know. Yeah. And I think yeah, it, it's cool great. because I'll, I'll talk about your freshman year. Um, you, and there might've been more than that, but it was three all and we played Vandy. It was three all we played Auburn. And you were down like 5-0 or 5-1 in both those matches in the third set and came back yeah. and went one. So I think that's just, I mean, that's all guts right there. That's not necessarily a better forehand or backhand. I think that was the most impressive thing to me too, is you were a freshman and able to do that because a lot of people don't have, aren't able to handle that pressure. So I completely agree. Fernanda, what was a highlight for you in your tennis career? Um, well, there are two parts, right? Like playing for a team, I would say, representing Peru and Davis Cup, that was probably a highlight, you know, being, you know, when you go into, uh, into playing Saturdays, which is the doubles, that day there's a ceremony and they, 
they play the national anthem and they bring the, the flag. So it, it's very patriotic, you know, and um, that's really a moment that I really cherish a lot. And the other one was playing the Grand Slams and my highlight in the Grand Slam was playing center court opening day against Ivan Lendl on the yeah. French Open. So that was, um, because I played in stadiums where you have 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Davis Scott, the biggest stadium was like five, 6,000 people. And when you go into the stadium, you know, Philippe Chartier and Roland Garros, and you have 14,000 people, you know, it was kind of a, you know, opening day. It was kind of a little bit, you know, intimidating, you know. So, so that was probably a highlight, I would say. But before you go, you know, we talk about, you know, why you start playing tennis and one is passion. Passion, when you play a sport, is because you have fun. You love it. Yeah. But if you don't have obsession, you don't go to the next level. If you look at all these people that make it, Unless you're so lucky because you have a physical, extraordinary talent, you don't go to the next level and guess you're obsessed. Like if you look at Feather, Nadal, Djokovic, all those guys are completely obsessed. They don't let you know it, but they're obsessed. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Because Natal, you talk about like, oh, I liked being on the court, you know, maybe four hours and that was good enough for me. And I didn't want to talk about it at home and... Yeah, I feel the same way. I was like, I had my time on the court. And my dad would just talk tennis all the time at home. And you can do this and you need to do that. And, oh, yeah, Emily, watch this. <laughs> he's he's going to take me. Yeah. I mean, not everyone's going to get that. But. Yeah, but I do I'm think. I'm hungry. I want to go home. I do think it's so relative because I even, I did an interview with Melanie and Dan a couple weeks ago and, and Whitney Kay, their roommates. And, they both just talked about how it was normal for them to just like wake up in the morning and do push-ups and jump ropes and all these things. And they were doing this on their own. And then they went to bed on their own and woke up early. Oh, I was not the same way. And thank I am thankful for my dad as my coach, because I don't think I would have gotten to where I was without that like little hand on my back being like, you need to do these things. And yeah. so I think it is like, I think for both of us, if we, might have been a little more obsessed with it and put a little more time and we we could have been much better and but i i think it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning like what are we staying true to and are we buying in and you can have the best experience ever it's just about what you make it to be um but i think you're completely right fernando i think if you want to be the absolute best you're thinking about it constantly you're doing the extra thing and it's it might not be fun all the time but you know you know where you're putting the money in the bank yeah, you know the payoff yeah. well obsession is going to make you work on your weaknesses regardless if you like it or not mm. and you, and once you realize you can work on those weaknesses and improve and make them better is what takes you to the next level but if you are just comfortable and saying yeah i'm That's passionate i love tennis but i'm not going to take that extra, you know, work on what I need to do and improve, then, then you can get to a level to where is your max, right? But it's also the, the picture of if that makes you happy, then more power to you. Because maybe if you go to that obsession and you don't like it and it's, you know, then, then you're living a miserable life. So, Yeah, that's good. Natty, last thing. What if you were giving advice to – a younger junior player who had their dad as their coach, what would you tell them? I would say communication for sure, because I think if you can communicate and have boundaries and have goals, then I think that a lot of the fights and stuff can be um, avoided, you know, but, um, but yeah, have boundaries. No. Okay. If we're going to talk about it at home, we'll talk about it for 30 minutes because it's going to be productive. It's going to be part of, you know, our uh, our program or whatever. Just have, have yeah, have that clarity because I feel like um, it is hard to – it is easy to talk about it at home and then, you know, it become overwhelming for a player that doesn't necessarily want to keep training or talking about it. And, and just, yeah, and just have um, more communication because I feel like if – 
I mean, I'm a believer that thing, things happen for a reason, but I, you know, if I could go back and I think we could have, I, it, we made things work because I think he had a good feel for what was my tolerance. But um, I think a, it would have been a lot more positive. If we could have been able to communicate on, on some days, obviously most days worked, but like on those yeah. days that were rough, I think communication definitely uh, having a clear plan would have helped. But um, as long as you're just on the same page, because I feel like uh, we were able to feel out being on the same page, he knew not to push me too much because I probably wouldn't have wanted to keep competing or training at the same level that year because I wasn't that devoted to the game at 14 compared to like 16. You know what I mean? I feel like mine was super gradual, but, um, but yeah, I would, and kind of like what he said, going back to just being able to make sure you're still enjoying it and still, it's still a happy thing that brings you together because once it starts becoming more of a negative thing then you just kind of have to reevaluate and and just kind of um go back to that communication to make sure it doesn't get to that point but i would just say yeah just you know enjoying it and and just um communicating working together having fun with it because um at the end of the day you you want to enjoy it right yeah and yeah and it relationship yeah <laughs> <laughs> for real for real well y'all were <laughs> Y'all were awesome. I'm so thankful I got to talk to you. And Fernando, it's good to see you. I talked to Natty this past weekend, so I saw her recently, more recently. But <laughs> y'all keep keep working hard, and I'll talk to y'all soon, and I'm super thankful for y'all. All right. Well, thank you for your interview. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody. Thanks, everybody who watched. And, everyone, and everyone, go check out Saber.